So it's a great pleasure to be speaking at this meeting. Uh, I was a graduate student at Princeton in 1972 and saw, uh, I think, three of uh, Thurston's uh, famous uh, lectures that he gave in full fall. Uh, and I really want to thank Yasha for the in, in the intervening decades, he kept me connected with this uh, age principle subject, selected contact and all that. If it wasn't for him, I probably would have randomly walked off. And then uh, in recent years, I wanted to thank Sam Merrickin and Gil you know, Mengez for uh, sort of coaching me back into shape, you know, like a, a runner. So I could uh, do a little. And uh, this talk actually uh, is based on, uh, you could think of it as a codicil to it. A paper that Gail recently published uh, on uh, uh, quasi elementary uh, foliations, which is a very geometric proof of the Mather Thurston theorem. So the Mather Thurston theorem stated algebraically is that the map between The homeo of any manifold with the discrete topology to be homeo with the ordinary continuous topology in a cyclic map. In particular, it induces an isomorphism homology. But it has a more geometric uh, statement, and thanks to uh, Gail, very geometric proof. And the statement, uh, the statement uh, is that uh, if you have a bundle in low differentiability, and I'll discuss how uh, low, the fiber, so the base and the and the fiber are manifolds, and this is some bundle. But it, we don't assume it has a flat connection. And this discrete topology is kind of flat connection world. And this is the continuous world. And the statement that this is homology isomorphism translates with a little magic through the T. Hertzberg spectral sequence to a geometric statement where the homology statement is replaced by bordism, which is a homology theory. And the statement is that. There's a bordism connecting a bordism W connecting a cobordism connecting V to another manifold V star over which the bundle extends. So the same fiber, of course, X. But on this side, there's a flat connection. That connection is a synonym for a foliation transverse to the X fibers of the bundle. And all this is in the topological category, though Mather Thurston can be enhanced with Suboy. And then this theorem works uh, C1. So the original discussion was topological. It's, the statement holds C1. I'm actually going to be working in an intermediate category, which is by Lipschitz. That's the most convenient one for me because some, though I can start off C1, some construction is going to inevitably move it to by Lipschitz. So, the theme of this talk, you know, this is a conference on the H principle. H is for homotopy, H is for homotopy. And as we heard from Gail, and at least in his warm up talks, uh, to get the audience ready for this, the par general participants, we discuss the C principle. So basically, sometimes you can solve a problem given formal data just by homotopy. This is this holonomic the theory. And sometimes uh, you can't quite do it. So singularities get in your way. And you have to rip those singularities out and put something else in. And that process is a cobordism. And if you have a harder problem that you can't solve by C, you can't solve by cobordism, it's called C principle. And the goal of this talk is to try to move H closer to C. 
So there's less difference. So let me uh, explain in pictures what I mean. So um, let me draw two cobordisms for you of a slightly different character. And I'm going to draw the pictures in two dimensions. So I apologize for using unfashionable disconnected manifolds. But if you drew similar pictures in high dimensions, there'd be nothing disconnected. So here's a picture of W, V at this end and say V star at this end. And here's a different picture. So uh, what's the question for the audience? You know, what's the fundamental difference? I would write this picture is better than this picture. Closer. Sorry. This one. What I wanted to say is I'm going to move C closer to H. I'm going to try to make cobordisms more like products. So why is this one closer to a product than this one? On one side. On one side, it's closer. <laughs> <laughs> so this one has a, um, here W, in, 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 in this case, W retracts to be. In this case, there does not exist a retraction. Let me remind you that there's an inclusion map W, and the retraction is a map in the other direction, R, so that the composition of R followed by the retraction is homotopic to the identity, or is the identity, it doesn't matter in this case. So, this can't possibly retract back to this end because of this R has nowhere to go. This one clearly retracts. Well, actually, you know, I'm an topologist and actually it took me a minute to see the retraction, so let me show it to you. <laughs> it, it's more obvious if you draw this example as a cylinder with two holes in it on the side, then you can just take the retraction like that. And then these two holes get smashed in like that during the retraction. Okay. Is it easier to smash the ends to points and then like, you know, it's a disk? Yeah, that's I think pretty much the same. So um, I want to think of this uh, mather thurston discussion as constructing the bordism in terms of the language of solving a problem. So I'll consider this bundle you're presented with as the problem. And the problem is you don't see the flat connection on it. And when you found this flat connection, I'll call that the solution. And the first thing I want to show you is a formal argument that doesn't look into the black box, that just takes like Deuce McDuff's paper or some other paper on Mather Thurston theory and doesn't look in the proof. You just sort of skim through the statements. And from that, uh, you can immediately see that you can sharpen this geometric statement to say that the solution, that in going from problem to solution, you can always find a W that retracts. So I just want to show this to you as a warm up, and then I'll come to what I really want to show. Which one does it retract to? Oh, it retracts to V. Yeah, just as I showed here. True. In other words, the problem end is regarded as the simple end, and you have to make it more complicated to solve the problem. But the point is, there's sort of a partial order on manifolds of a given dimension, uh, given by the existence of degree one maps from one to the other. So this is more complicated over here because three is more complicated than one. And what I'm going to show you now is that you can solve a problem by making it the manifold and the base more complicated. You don't have to first like make it simpler and then more complicated. That's the point of this first little warm up. You know, 
central borders of Zone and you're talking about today are really directional. They're going to go from easy or the simpler manifold in the problem setting to the slightly more complicated manifold in the solution. So let's give the base uh, D a triangulation or a cell structure. A, actually, let's give it a handle structure. Oh, it's not very different from a triangulation. So if I draw this picture in the plane, you can imagine that I have um, points, edges, uh, triangles, simplices of higher dimension. Handles just mean they've been thickened appropriately. Uh, they don't have to be simplices, they could be laterals. Now, uh, of course, the blackboard's a little poor in terms of dimensionality. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you to, in your mind, add one dimension to everything you see. So think of these as the one dimensional things, these as the two, and this is the three. Any bundle can be made flat over its one skeleton. That's tautological. Nothing's going on over the one skeleton. There's no possible curvature. So the first issue you encounter is, can you flatten the bundle over its two skeleton? And in my picture, this is the, this, the two skeleton. This looks like it's one dimensional. Now, oh good, there's colors here. We could just consider some appropriate um, relative problem over the core of this handle, restricting the bundle to that relativized near where we've already flattened it near the boundary constitutes a relative Mather-Thurston problem. For simplicity of notation and pictures, I stated the theorem for closed manifolds, but everything works fine, rel boundary if the boundary is already solved. That connection. So let's solve the problem in pictures over the two skeleton. And let's say, call this edge an H2 for two handle. And now imagine sort of out of the blackboard, I construct a cobordism to some perhaps hygienous surface, which will draw like this. So here's the solution to the problem over the two handle. I'm sorry, it has to be, you have to think of that coming out of the blackboard. And here's the solution, the problem over this two handle, and here's the solution over here. Now, it's easy to retract, and I'll draw the retraction just with a kind of a bold arrow. It's easy to retract this solution back to its base, back to the core, because, well, to say it in a slightly fancy way, the disk is a terminal object in the category of manifolds with boundary and degree one maps. Everything maps to a disk. Just like in the closed case, you can map any manifold degree one to the sphere just by taking a little neighborhood of a point and collapsing everything else. So there's no problem retracting. Well, now we have. Shouldn't it agree on the boundary though? You mean? Between different. It, it does agree on the boundary. We only boarded real boundary. When, when you have a bounded problem, you don't have to change it on the boundary if you already have a solution on for the boundary. Oh, oh we have a projection as well. Well, because you see the boundary here looks like these zero handles, but I told you to add one to each dimension. So over the boundary, on the boundary, it's the one skeleton where I said it's tautological to flatten bundles. So everything's lined up on the boundary. Now, there's a new problem in the picture constituted by the three cell in the middle here. Use blue. Union, these three sheets coming up, the three previous solutions in the lower dimension. That corresponds, that, that is the new problem. And it's solved on its boundary. And now the Thurston world boundary says, well, now there's a three dimensional solution. It's a little hard to draw it now, but it's, it's something that comes down 
and has these three ragged edges. I can't reproduce exactly the way I drew those wiggles. So there's sort of, there's some shell that comes down. The green on top is the solution to the three-dimensional problem, and the bulk inside would be the four-dimensional vortice from the problem to the solution. And similarly, because this three-dimensional disk is a terminal object in the category of three-dimensional manifolds of boundary and degree one maps, there's a retraction here. So just cell-wise, we can solve the problem relatively and build the retraction as we go. End of the story. So that's cheap, painless way without looking inside the proof to slightly improve the statement that you could just take your manifold and it's this kind of cohortism that elaborates the manifold a bit but never simplifies it. Okay, now I'll tell you what I really want to do. That, that moves C a little bit toward H in the sense that this is closer to a product than this. Because so are you saying that we can make this star equal D? No, no, I'm saying that we, we no, V star is not equal to V. That would be an H, the H principle. But W not trivial. What? But W not trivial, but N the same. Not no, w it's not the same. Yeah. No, N, absolutely not the same. Um, uh, what I'm doing is I'm building a So let's just go back to the very start. I took one of these edges, which is a two cell. In the picture, that's where the problem starts. So actually, since we're just, I'm just gonna focus on the edge for a minute, I'll draw it in its actual dimensionality. So this edge here, it's real picture, it's a two cell like this. And we have some bundle over this two cell, but it's not flat, there's curvature in that bundle. But we know a trick that we can increase the genus of that two disk to a high genus surface, and then use some fact of writing the holonomy as a product of commutators to solve the problem over that surface. So when I drew this wiggly um, yellow line, it was really supposed to evoke in your mind a high genus surface over which the problem was solved. Yeah, yeah. And so that, you just say that we can project it. There, there, yeah, project, that's called retraction. There's a retraction like this. And I'm saying we solve the problem a simplex at a time or handle core at a time, constantly building the projection into the solution. It's no big deal. It's just, it, it, this is just, this is like a warm up. This is like cocktails before dinner. But as you see, the edge, the solution, this is going to become part of uh, V star. This is included in the ultimate V star. And it's definitely not. We've definitely made, so it's just like I illustrated the pictures here. The right-hand edge is not the same topology as the left-hand edge, but there is a retraction. That's all we've done. Okay, now I want to explain what I'd actually like to do. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> make V star semi escobordic to V. Well, I almost dropped this eraser down that same hole. <laughs> I can see how it happens. It kind of sticks at one edge and then it twists out of your hand. It's very, very tricky. So, um, so here's just the definition. We have W and two boundaries, which are the first one and the second one. They're not interchangeable. And we say this is semi escobordism semi escobordism Even only if the inclusion of V into W is a simple homotopy equivalence. Uh, if you're not familiar with this simple category, don't worry about it. Just you can understand 99% of the content here without the word simple. 
It's just some whitehead thing about cellular structure that reflects. So, for instance, if you want to prove the H cobordism theorem and the manifold's not simply connected, you need a tiny bit stronger hypothesis, not the homotopy equivalent, which comes from whitehead's theory. Now, this does not imply that the inclusion of V star into W is a homotopy equivalence. Certainly not a simple homotopy equivalence. It's actually rather close. Using Lefschetz duality in the universal cover, you find that what is true, what is true is that V star included into W is a um, isomorphism homology of W with group ring coefficients by one, sorry, W. Let me check this way. Let me say it this way that um, uh, this vanishes. If I take the relative homology groups with coefficients in z pi one, this is zero for all star. And the pi one here is the pi one of w, which is isomorphic to pi one of v. Of course, those are homotopy equivalent. Is this simple homotopy equivalence um, this condition equivalent to being able to construct an inverse homotopy equivalence by collapse of cells, iterative collapse of cells? I'm sorry, what are the cells? I just uh, uh, collapsing cells. Uh, um, I mean, you you collapsing okay. cells. Collapsing. Oh, collapsing. collapsing. Yeah, yes, yeah. it does collapse. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, let me give you the simplest example possible of a. Um, of a semi escobordism So here's what a semi escobordism is in the case of no ambient fundamental group. Is let um, take a take a compact uh, contractible manifold many dimension. Like the, this might be the famous major manifold in dimension four, but there are many co contractible manifolds with boundary. Whose boundary is not a sphere, whose boundary has fundamental group. It's a homology sphere. So let this be one, and then just cut out a, a ball somewhere in the manifold and call it this annular looking region between them, call that W. And then this is the easy end, this is B. And this is the more complicated end, V star. This is the homology sphere, this is the actual sphere. And how do they differ? Well, they really only differ because of this perfect fundamental group that V star has that's absent here. And the general conclusion from just a little algebraic topology is the general conclusion is that the fundamental, in all cases, the fundamental group of this more complicated end, V star, is an extension of a perfect group by the fundamental group of V. That's algebraically how you should think that you've enhanced the manifold. And what I want to do in moving C back to H is I want to, in as many cases as I can, and you'll see for when I state the result, as many cases as I can, I want to say you can solve your problem doing very little damage to the manifold. You don't have to change its homology. You just change its fundamental group by an extension of a perfect group. Okay, yeah, so let me just state uh, the theorem. Is um, this works? If um, the tension of V, which I'm um, which I'll 
uh, calling P, call P, little p, the dimension of V always, is equal to three. If the base of the, if the, base of the problem is a three-dimensional manifold that can be either closed or open with a solution already present on the boundary. Then this works. You can move the cobort. You can modify the cobordism until it's uh, semi s cobordism. And if it is greater than or equal to four, this works. Anyway. What I mean by stably is uh, after crossing with a large torus. So you have to cross with circles many times over in the argument. So I'll just write the torus as Tn or n some big number. And what do I mean by crossing with a torus? Oh, uh, well, I erased the, I erased the problem, but we have this fiber, we have this fiber bundle. I can imagine crossing the base with the torus and just pulling the bundle back over um, the projection. So this gets crossed with the torus and of course the fiber just stays the same. So you can always stabilize a problem. And uh, what I'd like to do going forward and what I've been talking to Gail about is trying to figure out how to remove the stabilization in high dimensions. But what I hope to show you is how the argument works in detail in dimension three and what the obstacle is, uh, how, and then how you solve a high dimensional problem with stabilization and what the potential is for simplifying for removing the stabilization. But, but you, you think that it's not needed in high dimensions? I hope, to, I hope so. Yeah, I hope it's not needed. I think, there's, I, I think there's good reason to hope that it's not needed, that this is very general. Uh, just to ask, when you say this works, you're talking about this extension uh, of the fundamental uh, uh, of P, or what exactly is? Uh, th this works mean, means that uh, W uh, can be chosen. Okay. Uh, semi S cobordism. Not the general cobordism. Any other? Can you please elaborate why p is greater than or equal to four, not six, for example? No, no, no. You have, have to see the proof. Let's sit, see the proof in dimension three, why it works, and we see what goes wrong, and then you'll see why four, four causes problems. Four is a problem child anyway, right? Yeah, but you already know that there's a V star. There is. I don't have the hypothesis if you have a V star. Well, that's a theorem. That's Thurston Mather theorem. No, I just wanted that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, there is some W. So that's there why. Some w. Okay. There is some W. That's that's why. Um, like I wrote a paper on this called Control Mather Thurston. So Mather Thurston has done long ago, but Gail's recent paper on complementary foliation gives a sufficiently geometric proof that you can kind of dive into the proof and try to uh, improve the cobordism. After all, if you think about this geometric formulation. It comes from a purely algebraic world. And then the Tia Hertzberg spectral sequence is used to turn homology into bordism. And that's how this geometric statement arises, but it doesn't give any information as to the structure of the cobordism. But once you have a geometric proof in your hand, you can start tinkering with the shape of that cobordism. And you can uh, then try to make it as close to a product as possible. If you could make it exactly a product, it would be down to H principle. We know that's asking too much. So I'm just trying to get as close as I can. And the motivation actually comes from physics. And if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll try to explain the motivation. But passing from homology to bordism just works over the rationals, right? If you work with rational. Uh, is, is this causing any trouble here or not? Or? No, no, it isn't. I mean, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the statement I gave is correct. That's the correct statement. Okay. Can you only, for this uh, stably for P greater than or equal to four, is, can you only cross it with the torus or can you cross it with something else? Yes, you can cross with something else. Okay. You can cross with any product of spheres. Okay. 
But let, let other people in the audience ask questions. Maybe you should. So now here's a place where I have to skip many details because I want to jump in at the end of the hour long lecture that Gail gave in the warm up session with a picture that might be familiar to you if you were at the session. So So this is a picture of the problem. It's a bundle. The fiber direction is X and the base is V. And I'm going to sort of draw on this total space, a Heffliger structure, which wants to be a Heffliger structure for a foliation transverse to the fibers. Now, usually adding a Heffliger structure uh, has an obstruction. You have um, a map from the total space and a classifying map. In this case, you're classifying the tangent, the vertical tangents. So that would, if, if the dimension of X is Q, and the dimension here is P, you classify the vertical tangents GL, P. And then there's a gamma um, here. And there's an upper index which shows the degree of differentiability. And the point is if you have low differentiability, if this is a zero or a one, the fiber is contractible. So there's no extra data in the lift. So we can always supply this Tefliger structure, even though it's no new information, it's very useful because then we can follow Gale's proof. And what the proof does is attempts to take this Heffliger structure and make it, I didn't get the perspective on my product very well. What the proof does is it tries to deform the Heffliger structure using Thurston jiggling lemma and Thurston's opening and closing windows. It tries to push it through um, a cell structure out to the front wall, EP plus one. And what's supposed to happen is this Heffliger structure is supposed to be made transverse, not just to the zero section of the normal bundle, but further transverse to the vertical foliation by the fibers X. And if that's done, then you've succeeded in solving the problem at the homotopy at the H level. But certain defects or clefts are formed in this process, which Gail described. And they come out on this front face. And we're particularly interested in the, the projection down on the front face, down in V0. And we need a name for this because what they are in Gale's paper is they're the projection of the boundary of the cleft. So this is the bad place where we can't solve the problem. And I'm gonna call these um, uh, uh, Negnez divisors. So there are these, Submanifolds down here, which uh, I'll write this way, sigma, and they're co-dimension two in V. And the reason I'm calling them divisors is because they're co real co-dimension two and something exciting happens when you go around them. And it's too much bother to say these three words. So the problem is the reason we can't do this by the H principle is around one of these divisors, sigma, we have a problem in the bundle that we can't solve. We have a hole in it. And the general, the usual solution, you know, which goes back 50 years in H principle, is to take this two-dimensional disk. You see, the disk is the worst possible thing when you have a holonomy around the boundary because it's simply connected. 
So there's no possible way of extending that hole not only across the disc. If you're trying to keep the connection flat, you'd have to put curvature on, which is the whole thing we don't want. So the whole game has been to replace this disc with a hygienic surface and exploit the fact that now the boundary on the level of fundamental group written as a product of commutators. And either through direct construction or using simpleness of uh, homeomorphism groups, you can take whatever holonomy the bundle demands, whatever holonomy this construction has left you with there, and you can realize it by an appropriate extension over that surface. So that's the, that's the idea of how to deal with clefts. And what I want to do is use um, a model, uh, uh, a different model, which is a little more ambitious topologically. This tries to solve the problem locally. Just you have, see a problem around a circle, you try to scan the circle. I want to, let's focus on the three-dimensional case. In the three-dimensional case, the clefts are one dimensional, remember P minus Q. So we have this sort of solid torus that has to be dealt with. And I want to just pop the whole solid torus out and put in something better rather than pop each disc out and put in something better. So to do this, I'm going to have to introduce some models. So these models are slightly more sophisticated than the disk. They're three-dimensional. They're going to replace the solid torus. And these models, in a way, go back to Thurston. So let me remind you, uh, let me remind you of a, a beautiful construction that of uh, the group PSL2R. With all its universal cover, this Lie group acts faithfully on every manifold. So particularly the manifold X, the fiber. Now, the reason is PSL2R. It acts on the hyperbolic plane, famously. So it also acts on the boundary of the hyperbolic plane. So when I put the twiddle over it, it acts on the universal cover of S1. So SL2R twiddle. Acts on R. But now comes the damage. We endpoint compactify. Or it's all compactify. And this becomes the interval. That's where you lose analyticity. It's a self similar thing going out to infinity. So when you one point compactify, it's more than continuous, it's Lipschitz, but it's not smooth anymore. And in fact, a theorem of Thurston's from his paper generalized, uh, generalizing the Reeb. Uh, Reeb Theorem, 1974 paper, uh, shows that uh, this cannot be made smooth. Lipschitz, by Lipschitz is the very best you can do. So once you have it acting on the interval, it can be easily promoted to any manifold. And the reason is, as soon as you have an action on an interval, fixing the endpoints, you can extend it by the identity on the rest of the circle. And then you can suspend as many times as you like the action. And what you end up with is an action on the sphere that's the identity on a big chunk. And you can just cut out a ball from that chunk where it's the identity. And now you have some non trivial, actually faithful action, on, faithful action on the other side. And as soon as you have a faithful action on a ball, well, you can embed a ball in any manifold. And now you have this ridiculous little action that just massages one ball around. But that's all we need, either by the simplicity trick. Uh, or by uh, direct construction due to Thurston and in Gale's paper. So this is a good starting point, having this representation. 
Now, how, how am I going to build the model that exploits this representation? Well, Yoshi, uh, the other day, introduced a very uh, beautiful specific three manifold in his discussion of less jets vibrations. And I want to return to that three manifold. It has a nickname, 237. It's a ciphered fibered space with hyperbolic base. And I'll call this, um, I'll call this, there's a homology sphere whose, sphere whose base is a sphere with three singularities, three punctures, and the degree of the singular fibers. Uh, it's a circle bundle over the sphere with three singular fibers of order two, three, and seven. And I'll call this, this sphere P, just for short. And the model I'm going to produce is first let me define what C bar is. This is a four dimensional thing. And what it is, it's um, this um, homology sphere with a disk removed. So that's what the minus is minus an essential R. Doesn't matter which R, just some essential R. And C is this space cross I. So it looks like this in the pictures. There's the punctured homology sphere. And another color, there's the arc. And then I cross with I. The arc becomes a disk. And if I And this is this, uh, and now let me define C. C will be, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, let me draw a second picture of this, which is to sort of take it and bend it around so that you see the, the two copies of the homology sphere, the, it, it and its mirror image connected some together at the top of the picture. So you see something like this at the top of the picture with two copies of the arc. And then you see a four dimensional manifold, which is sort of the sweep through. And in that manifold, you see this disk, which is R cross I. That's sort of the slice disk. And the top part of the picture um, is the model C. The top part of the picture is um, P minus union, P minus with the orientation reversed, minus a neighborhood of gamma union gamma with the orientation reversed. And this is uh, an interesting homology sphere. Uh, sorry, homology solid torus. This is a homology solid torus. Its boundary is a regular torus. But inside it has a structure, though its homology is the same. And C, I defined up here, is a relative concordance, a relative homology or cobordism to the standard solid torus, which is S1 plus T2. Okay, so now uh, I, it's unfortunate that I erased, I needed to erase uh, the, uh, the picture which referenced Gail's talk. But if you remember that picture, maybe I'll just reconstruct the bare bones. We had the original bundle cross I. And we had this divisor down here that was a one co-dimension two manifold. So in the special case when P is equal to three. This is a this is a one manifold. So this is a disjoint union of circles. By general position, these are embedded. So we just have sort of a lot of circles floating. So just to blow up what this means is we have a three-dimensional manifold. And in that three-dimensional manifold, we just have some link of circles. And what I want to do is to get to the, the, the actual V I want, 
I want to pop out the neighborhood of each of these circles and pop in a copy of C. But I actually want to do it by constructing a cobordism. That's why I pointed out that C bar, um, oh, left off the bar. Just tall enough. C bar is a relative cobordism uh, from C to that. Okay. So in red, let me draw that relative cobordism. It would just look like this. Just coboarding uh, by sticking on to this solid torus, this cobordism, which ends in this sort of more exotic C on the outer boundary. But now the beautiful thing is the representation will now extend because we have the following diagram. Um, the fundamental group of C maps to the fundamental group of P connected some minus P. So that's um, I1 of P. P is the complement of uh, some loop in P connected some minus P. This group is the free product. It's the fundamental group of P, uh, free product itself. Running out of blackboard here. Um, and then this, I'll just project one of the factors. This is pi one of P, by projection into either factor. And pi one of P includes, this is the key point, in SL2R twiddle, because that's the kind of manifold it is. It's an SL2R manifold. And this has this representation. I don't think I gave it a name, but this is the representation acting on the fiber X that I described before. So I'm able to uh, uh, produce around the problem. I'm able to extend some element uh, I'm able to take the holonome, some holonomy and extend it. And then you might wonder, well, is it the right holonomy? Is it the holonomy that comes from Gale's construction? And the answer is there are two roads to get the right holonomy. Either you argue by the Thurston simplicity trick, or you look at the details of Gale's construction, which allows you to choose in advance the holonomy that you see around the divisor. So that solves the problem. That constructs the, I didn't prove to you, but I will now just say, but this little, um, this sticking on this cobordism here is a semi s cobordism. And you may worry what happens about this solid torus unwrapping, but it never unwraps because this whole opening and closing the windows and pushing forward to the front face is a microscopic construction. And these link components that I diagrammed here are never long in the manifold. They're very small, they don't wrap around the fundamental group. So it's immediate to see that it's an H cobordism and actually. A uh, semi H cobordism and the simplicity is pretty trivial too, if you know that theory. So, in the final moment, let me just say what happens, why stabilize, and what happens. So, there was a question what happens in higher dimension? Why does it go wrong? What goes wrong in higher dimensions is this picture is no longer correct. The picture of the divisors being disjoint circles is bad. If you move up to dimension four, so now let's look at the picture when P equals four. And this is the same problem more or less that happens when P is five, six, or any other dimension is the divisors cross each other. And what Gale does in his paper is he just takes orders them and does them one at a time. So what you would do is he would solve the problem of the first divisor by popping it out and putting in a substitute. Now his substitute was hygiene surface cross S1. My substitute is C, but it's a very similar thing. You put in C here, but now you have another surface that now crosses through C. And now there's what in the paper is called pull through. You're able to produce at the end of the cobordism that's just created a divisor, but where it penetrates, it will change the topology of this component. 
because what you'll have to do is you'll have to co board this original guess, which is up here, out to the new boundary. And when you co board it, you'll have to replace what was a small disk where it crossed through with just a homological thing, something in the same relative homology class. So it'll be a high genus surface in this case. So what happened is, even though th this one might have been a T2, the original one, this next one will turn out to be um, a high genus surface, surface of genus G in dimension four. And now it looks like you're in trouble because we needed that circle factor in order to match the model. Now, if I was smarter and could make more models, and I'm trying to get smarter and talking to all you guys, then maybe I'd find a model you know, to deal with this one. But not being able to deal with that problem very constructively, uh, what's in the paper, this is on the archive, by the way, will appear in the European Journal of Math, if you want to look for it there. The solution is simply to add the missing circle factor for the model by brute force, by crossing the entire problem with a circle. So let's say the problem that we have, say the divisor that we're worried about in any dimension now, and this is at any stage in the problem, it doesn't matter whether it's the second, the first one we always get for free because of its structure, but it doesn't matter if it's the second, third, fourth, or whatever divisor component that we're looking at. So if the divisor is sigma, now in, in our mind, let's imagine this fantasy. Sigma is actually lowercase sigma cross S1. Well, the thing we have to remove, this would be a very good case. This would be an easy case if after the pull through, the manifold had an S1 factor. Because the thing we have to deal with is the neighborhood of this, these are single bundles. So what we really have to deal with is the divisor across D2. And if there was a factorization like that, a factor like this, then we could simply regroup the parentheses. And now this is amenable to our model. We can pop out a solid torus S1 cross D2. We can pop that out and replace it with a copy of our, our model. So here we would just do the same operation parameterized by sigma. So we'd be sitting pretty if this fantasy were true that the divisor at every stage had a circle factor. Well, it doesn't. But if we just take the entire problem, as I said, and cross it with S1, then we get a divisor of one higher dimension. It's still co-dimension two because every dimension popped up by one. But we just realized the fantasy by artificially adding the circle. So that's how you how you uh, make the stable argument. Uh, but, then you need to, but you have to do it each time, right? Yeah, each time. So it's uh, so you don't know how many. Times there was another. There was a previous talk where the number ten to the thirty-five came up, and uh -huh. that's my feeling here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you take very fine triangulations, every you know, then the whole Thurston world, everything is so it's going to be fantastically high dimensional stabilization. <laughs> yeah, so um, I think that's probably a good place to pause for questions. Oh, maybe I should just say one word about the physics motivation, and people might want to ask more. Um, you know, in uh, At moderate energies, like LHC and a thousand times higher energy, but still very moderate compared to string scales. Um, at moderate energies, the uh, universe is supposed to be described by gauge theory. You know, the standard model is U1 cross SU2 cross SU3 gauge theory. Some fields and Lagrangians you know, contain um, terms like there's a connection, the dynamical variable connection with, and then from the connection, you compute the curvature. And then you do things like uh, take F squared. I'm just trying to write F squared. What are the other terms? So we're used to kind of taxing uh, uh, configurations, field configurations, according to their curvature. You pay for curvature as part of the Lagrangian. 
But you could imagine, um, you could imagine a world where at the very fine scale of space time, there's topology that we don't know about because we can't probe it. So in other words, if you're, um, you know, we live in the infrared is the phrase in, in physics, you know, so how do you know when you probe, when you study space time, how do you know it's a, uh, that there isn't a lot of, that there isn't very complicated, perfect group hiding all around in space time? You know, how can you tell, you know, looking at large scales, whether there's um, curvature and holonomy around contractible loops, or loops that we think are contractible? How can you distinguish that from there being micro topology and loops that we think are contractible are actually hung up in this perfect extension. So the question is, can you uh, simulate um, the effects of curvature through uh, semi-escovortisms and flat bundles? So I'd like to try to find a duality where you can um, uh, reproduce at sort of low energies the uh, consequences of curvature without anything ever being curved. It's always just uh, different perfect groups. And you sort of, instead of paying for the curvature in the Lagrangian, you pay for the choice of perfect group. And I think that that's sort of a high energy motivation, but there's also low energy motivations in the theory of superconductivity. There are also Maxwell terms like this that could be, uh, uh, that could conceivably be replaced with terms where you, you pay uh, in topology and uh, also pay in distortion of the structure group uh, away, from, away from the Lie group to diffeomorphisms of the Lie group near, near the group itself. So maybe, maybe it's five, I'll call it there. Great talk. Is this relatable to graph theory at all? All right, was there a question? Yeah, is this relatable to graph theory at all, or is it known? Sorry, graph theory? Yeah. You mean like points and edges? Yeah, like computer science. Oh, Basically. computer science. You mentioned physics application. That's why I'm asking if there's also computer science relevances. You also worked for Microsoft, I've noticed. That's why you probably would know if there is any work related to it. Uh, yeah, uh, this is kind of like an interlude for things I do for Microsoft. <laughs> that was also part of the motivation for the question. You probably no. don't have another hour to explain that, but any like- no, I, don't think, I, I don't know of any, I, don't, I mean, uh, actually that is a good question. You know, uh, graph theory, uh, you know, like Fang Chung has this wonderful CBMS notes uh, sort of reproducing Romanian geometry in the context of graph theory. So I think you could say that the last three minutes I took there is in the spirit of her book. That is, there's like this thousands of books on uh, gauge theories on Romanian, over Romanian manifolds. And I'm suggesting a combinatorial analog where nothing is curved and everything is flat. And that um, instead you have to know everything in the world about all these perfect extensions instead of about curvature. So it's trying to like use perfect extensions instead of curvature. So maybe it's very analogous to trying to reconstruct all the ideas of Romanian geometry within graph theory. So actually, when you first said that, I said no, but now I say yes. Great, thank you. Uh, what, what, what would you say kind of like physical significance of, of the conditions that is as as not just any Oh, well, um, it, it's because um, uh, I mean, the goal is to change the, while solving the problem, to change the manifold as little as possible. And the physical assistance is the significance is you shouldn't be able to notice the change because, uh, you know, we, we seem to be living in locally four dimensional space time. So it, it should only be changed in some very subtle and small way. And um, you could say, well, the algebraic topology hasn't come up. It's just sort of a size scale. I could have added homology, but if the homology was on a small size scale, I also couldn't see it. Uh, so th that's a valid point. There could be changes in 
topology which are more brutal than semi-escobordism that still might pass the physical test. I'm not sure, but my but what I particularly like about the semi-escobordism picture is it turns it turns everything into this group theory. It's the only thing that you have to know. So, so if you really started to study this seriously, you'd want to know about the statistical physics of perfect group extensions. Like what are the most common uh, perfect group extensions? You know, what's probably what are the probability distributions on them? What what do you expect to encounter? So I just like the crispness that you just add this perfect group. So can I ask a question? I don't know if you can hear. I can hear. Oh. Is, there, is there an explanation in your approach to why C2 is a barrier? C2? Why the second differentiability condition stops you from doing your surgeries? Where would that be in your picture? Oh, OK. Um, yeah, so the original discussion from the old days of Mather and Thurston, they said all their language, as far as I know, or most of the language was in terms of homeo, homeo with discrete topology. Uh, but they were actually uh, working in practice in the bilipsis category, but just it's a cultural thing. In those days, uh, no one said bilipsis. It, it was like they were smooth and not smooth. It wasn't quite smooth. You just said homeomorphism. But, but but then this amazing work of Sue Boyce shows that uh, there, there's, a, I mean, the re, first let me say the reason Mather Thurston worked in the by Lipschitz category is they do need an infinite construction. The, the very simple proof, Mather's two page paper uses some infinite sort of geometric series on balls. So, and I think it was like a kind of a brilliant paper of Sue Boy that figured out how to do a little bit better and make this be one. But even if I made it C1, I wouldn't be able to throw on that model. That model is only uh, a, a representation in the Bi-Lipschitz category because of this endpoint compactification. And it's not just that that's all I know how to make. Thurston's 1974 paper shows that you can't make a representation of a finitely generated perfect group acting on a, a ball identity on the boundary. Now that's a corollary of that. That paper on generalized group stability. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's thank Mike again.